Yeah, good mate, how are you? Good, good, yeah. What's been happening? Oh, not much because of this drizzle. Yeah, it but, has uh, been a bit wet, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, you go outside and the sun shines and as soon as you get outside and drizzles again, you <laughs> go back inside and the sun comes out. Yeah, same over at Yungaburra. Hang the washing out and the next minute I'm pulling it in and hanging it out. And yeah, mine, mine's been on the back veranda for two days. Yeah, oh, well, that's good. <laughs> Yeah, what, what, how's your church service been going? So on a Sunday morning, what? Very good, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just, the services we've had. What, what, watch it sort of in the morning or at night or? No, no, about lunchtime, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, but, yeah. No, we've, I've been watching a few as well and yeah, yeah. getting a lot out of them anyway. It's good that we're able to. That's right, no, it's, it's amazing. It's, as I've said, you know, to, to have this technology is marvellous when we can't come to church. Yeah, it is amazing yeah. and it's good that the restrictions are loosening off a bit too, that we can start right. going out we to can, a cafe. It's a yeah. real blessing of God for That's right. asking yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. All right, mate. Well, yeah. we better go and see what this week's church. You're, you're starting it, aren't you? Yes, I am. Yes, All right, yes. well, let's go. Okay. Good morning church and welcome to our Sunday morning service. I'll begin with prayers this morning. Heavenly Father, help us to remember your command to love one another. Help us to care for our neighbours, our loved ones during this terrible global pandemic. Generous God, we thank you for every blessing you bestow upon us. Lord God, give you thanks for the food, health, for each breath we take, also for our freedom. We pray for those who are poor in spirit, oppressed, heavy laden, sick or in despair. Please comfort and cure the, those suffering from the global virus and accept into your kingdom those that have died. Lord, pray for your blessings on your people throughout the world with your healing and peace. No matter what names, nationality, race or religion we call ourselves, we are all your children. Help us to reconcile our differences and bring to an end the disturbing public demonstrations all over the globe. Everlasting God, we pray that in all we do, we may walk, walk more closely with you at our side, safe in the knowledge that we know you are the most powerful. Father, we know that your fatherly love will care for us no matter what we do and will forgive us for our sins and misdoings. We pray for the welfare of our church, guide and govern it by your Holy Spirit so that when this crisis we face is resolved by your amazing grace, more people will turn to you knowing that you are all powerful. We commend to your fatherly goodness all who are afflicted or distressed in body, mind and circumstance due to the global virus. Lord, please bless us and our families through your loving son Jesus, who we know is the rainbow at the end of every storm. Amen. Now our reading for this morning is from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore to send out workers into his into his harvest fields. Here ends the lesson. Praise the Lord. Now I will uh, call on Reverend Johnson for our Sunday message. Good morning, church. Uh, I do welcome you all. Thank you, for Paul, Paul, for the prayers. We want to thank God uh, that we are here by his grace. Uh, as we have heard from our reading, which comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 35 to 38, I've come up with a theme, walking the streets with compassion, walking the streets 
with compassion. In our lesson for today, Jesus is making his way through all the towns and villages of that region, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Can't you imagine how thrilled the people were to see him? Then Matthew says something quite significant about Jesus' attitude towards people. He says, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. On verse 36. Can you think of a better description of the mass of people both then and today? Harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. What a parable of contemporary life. Harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. It is a marvelous metaphor or more probably a striking simile. Can you not see a flock of sheep miling around in a pen, frightened and confused, they stumble blindly, binding helplessly into one another? And because they don't know which way to turn, how like so many people we see every day in our lives? You do realize, don't you, that many religious people, including many religious leaders, look on some crowds with scorn and not compassion. It is so easy to look down on people according to the way they look or what they wear or what they, the way they talk. Friends, Jesus had compassion on the crowds because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. John, in his gospel, after giving us that wonderful verse that says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believed in him should be saved, he writes this, for the son came into the world not to condemn the world, but to that the world through him might be saved. So you can see that Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. So what a startling piece of good news that it is. The son came into the world not to condemn the world. That means there is hope for everyone in the world. Even us, eh, hope for everyone. When I mean everyone, I mean every person. There's hope. It would have been easy for Chris Christ to condemn the crowds. That's what many preachers have done through the years, condemn the crowd for their sins. Let them feel the fires of hell lapping at their feet. But Jesus took a different approach. He had compassion for the crowd. That was what Jesus was about. And that's what you and I are about too. We need to have compassion. The gospel reading tells us Jesus went out to the towns and villages teaching, preaching, and healing every kind of disease and sickness. But beyond the physical ailments, he also knows that the crowds were harassed, confused, and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. An aggressive predator can leave a flock of sheep either quivering or prostrate, paralyzed with fear or scattered, running confused, crazed with panic. Scripture tells us that we are, in fact, being stalked and attacked in this life by the predator of all predators. And the devil, who is compared to a rolling lion, sneaking and prowling around to find someone to attack and devour. Harassed, helpless, and confused sounds like symptoms that fit our time and world, don't they? So many people feel harassed and helpless, locked in their homes, locked in jobs, and schedules that enslave and control rather than bring satisfaction and contentment. So the disease we experience at work or in our mismanagement of time then affects negatively all of most our important relationships, including the relationship with God. And then that happens, the devil roars with delight. He now roars like a rolling lion. In this postmodern world, where everything is presented and as being relative, where all values are neutral, and where no absolute truth can supposedly be known with any certainty, confusion and instability reign supreme, looking for a quick fix from one self-help guru with a new old idea to the next. But we never find lasting peace and wholeness and a sold place upon which to build our lives and our future. Satan sees it all and zooms with contentment at our confusion. Everywhere we turn, we are confronted with a society and lives full of physical, emotional, social, spiritual sickness. How do we respond to these things? What 
effect does the crowd have on us? If we see a crowd, does it have any impact on us? Does it phrase panic suck us in? Does it weary resignation fill us with fear of or loathing? Or does the sight of the crowd harass and hopeless like the sheep without a shepherd fill us with compassion as it did Jesus? Let's be clear about this. Jesus wasn't just sorry for the crowd. As one translation is make it see. No, the Greek word used here in verse 36, splanthesis, means that Jesus was filled with a gut-wrenching compassion, a compassion that reached out in words and deeds. This gut-wrenching compassion would lead Jesus to the cross to die for the crowd, for the world, for you, for me. And while we were yet helpless and harassed, confused and lost enemies of God, Jesus came to us, came with remedy for what ails the world. So the good news of the reign of God's love come to him, come to us here through Jesus Christ. So the love of God has broken into our world in a radically new and paradoxically powerful way, bringing life, health, wholeness, and cleansing through the forgiveness of sins. Part of the paradox of the good news is that Jesus follows us, formerly harassed, panicked, sheep without a shepherd themselves, are integral to God's remedy. When we see the crowd in the streets we are walking, we are the people who have been assigned by Jesus Christ to preach the word of compassion. Not only preach, but to act on compassion. And that is very important for us as believers. We who have been marked with the cross of Christ forever in the waters of baptism are claimed, gathered, and sent by God's goodness for the sake of the world because the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The harvest is ready, but the workers are not there. And that's why he said, you need to send the workers to do the work in the field that is, uh, that is ready. They are harassed, helpless people out there, around the corner from where we live, working in the same shopping mall. In the next cubicle to ours, living across the street, right next door, perhaps even in the same house with us. They are lost sheep without a shepherd, ready to respond to the good news. They are lost sheep everywhere where we are walking. Who needs the good news? Who is caring for these people? Who will have compassion on them? The harvest is plentiful. It is the laborers who are few. That is why Jesus told his disciples and then tells us today to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers to bring in the harvest. Let us pray for that, for God, to God, so that he can bring more people into the right field, so that we can harvest. Look everywhere. I think there are none believers than believers. If you look about it, think about it. There are more none believers, which means true, the harvest is ready. Prayer is the first step. It is not a substitute for work. But the work will not be done without prayer. So we pray and work. Notice immediately after Jesus tells his disciples to pray that God would send out laborers into the harvest. He sends those who he asks to pray out as the answer to that prayer. So when you pray, be in the position that you are the one to be the answer. You are the one who is supposed to go. You are the one who is supposed to do the work. The principle at work here is what the reformer Martin Luther taught in his explanation of the Lord's Prayer. Whenever we pray that God would do something, we first of all pray that God will begin with us. We are Christ's hands and feet now today in our world. We are the people. We are the chosen people to do God's work. We are part of God's answer to the prayer for laborers to bring in the harvest. The one who prays does what God wants done. And the one who prays is ready to go where the need is and where God sends us. We are supposed to be driving out. And you know what? The gears in this car is only come and go. There are only two. Come and go. So you need to be going with the word of God. Jesus, of course, sends us too. And what both the disciples and we are to do is carry out the same ministry 
of good news that Jesus did. This involves preaching, healing, cleansing, driving out evil spirits, and raising the dead. So in terms of harassed and helpless people, it means setting them free from whatever harasses them. Securing their human right is one way. Ending their stereotypes and that label them is another way. Thwarting any power that seeks to oppress and victimize them is to another. He understands their situation of despair as the time of God's harvest. They need and are ready for new life. His compassion acts. He calls his disciples together and sends them out into the fields. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into this harvest field. Who is he talking about? Who are the workers sent out in the field? At that time, it was the disciples. Today, it is us. But please notice, the motivation is the same in both cases. We are to go out in the harvest field because of our compassion for people. We need to be compassionate people. That's who we are and that's what we are about. Compassionate people. We are not a, a business enterprise. Our motive is not a more impressive bottom line. Our goal is not to enhance our institutional pride. Our aim is not to be the biggest and the best church in town. We are called to go out into the world because there are people outside the walls of this church who are confused, angry, hating, and dying. There are families that are disintegrating, young minds being destroyed by drugs and alcohol, old people feeling forgotten. There are people outside of this building who need our help. Yes, we are to bring them to Jesus, but first of all, we are to make Jesus real to them by showing them his love, his compassion. That's what we need to do. So you see, one problem in the church today is that some of us have never been in a situation where we really need help ourselves. We have never slept for two days without food. We have never been homelessness. And that is what has happened. Since, because we have never experienced these things, we think it's nothing, it doesn't happen anyway. Many of us in this affluent society have lived somewhat charmed lives. We may not consider ourselves wealth, but in contrast to more than half of the world's people, we are real. We are rich. Jesus knew that it was to give to people who could to give back. That's what he did for us. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Because they were harassed and hopeless like sheep without a shepherd. He, th he thought about it. And there were so many of them. Just like today and like then, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. What then is to be our prayer? Jesus tells us quite concisely. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore to send out workers into his harvest field. Because it's ready. I think the, the ratio, the proportion is one is to four. If you meet, or more than that, one is to ten. One Christian among ten non-believers. So it means the proportion is too high, so... Every person we conduct, we are able to witness and bring them to the Lord's harvest. I want you to join me in praying daily that we become a more compassionate church. Deep in our hearts, we know that it is what Christ wants out of us. He wants us to care enough about people to become involved in their lives. He wants us to be willing to take time to show love to young people and old folks, to the substance abuser and the victims of broken families to the down and out as well as the up and in. Having compassion, one of another, love breathing, be pitiful, be cautious, 1 Peter 3 verse 8. So the good Samaritan became involved in helping the less fortunate. He didn't run away or look the other way. That's why he was called the good Samaritan. He had to help. He, he, he was forced through compassion to help. It's action, not just talking. Compassion is actively. Compassion does something. It is not primarily a feeling, even though feelings are involved. It is not a sense of pity or of pain or of sorrow. To say, I feel sorry for that person or I am distraught over their situation is not yet compassion. To suffer indigestion over the plight of the world's hungry is not yet compassion. Even to cry ourselves to sleep at night over the suffering of another is not yet compassion. Compassion acts. It walks through all the towns and villages it calls. 
It aches. Compassion calls for the courage to come forward to help with the job that needs to be done. Compassion doesn't falter or give in to fear or, fear or failure. It was compassion that propelled Jesus through all the towns and villages. It was compassion that enacted when he preached the good news and healed every disease and sickness. It was compassion by which he still saw the people when he completed his work. And it was compassion by which he continued to save them. When one really walks the streets and gets in touch with the real people, one needs to see cheats, liars, and vagabonds. Compassion paints a different picture. Compassion helps us cut through the quick and preset judgments of stereotypes. It sees through appearance into the heart of things. So the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers. It is filled. And we need to say amen to that. We are the ones we are called to go out. There is a simple no escaping it. Like the disciples before, we are an integral part of God's remedy for what else the world. Ordinary people like you and me are called by God for his extraordinary work in the world. Jesus' ministry is our ministry. To do no harm, but in both, in our ways and actions and attitudes, God's remedy that is good for what ails the world. We are there where there is a brokenness. We will bring reconciliation through the amazing power of the forgiveness of sin revealed at the cross of Jesus Christ. When people feel excluded and ostracized, we bring the cleansing touch of inclusion and welcome in Jesus' name. Where life is overshadowed by the fear of death, we will bring hope by proclaiming Christ's resurrection. Wherever we find evil at work, whether at home, in the church, at school, at work, in society in general, or whether halfway around the globe, we will still oppose it with all our might in Jesus' name. His gut-wrenching compassion compels us so that others may be freed from bondage to falsehood and injustice. So the compassion of the triune God compels us so that the horrors and the helpers of this world might come to know Jesus as we have come to know him. God's very personal remedy for what else the world is us. Amen to that church. We need to think about it. You and me, we have been called for that purpose, to go out with compassion. Whoever we meet, we meet people who are homeless. What do we do? Do we leave them? We meet people in the streets. We have no food. Do we just leave them? We need to feed them. We need to clothe them. We need to show them love. We need to support them. It is you and me. We don't need to put names on them, labels on them. We need to just show love. They are God's children. When God sees them, he sees his children. Not the way you see them. See them the way God sees them. May the good Lord bless us as we continue to follow Jesus' footsteps of being compassionate. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus sent the disciples to proclaim the gospel, to cure the sick, to raise the dead, to welcome the outcasts, to cast out demons. Jesus calls us to do the same. Jesus, help us to be your disciples. Those who are willing to love your people. Those who are willing to be compassionate. In your name I pray. Amen. Now I will call Paul to come and to pray for the offerings. Uh, I hope you all prepare your offerings before Paul prays. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your blessings upon us. And remember that you work hard for us and it's our place to look after your church and continue its great work. And we cannot do that without the offering. We thank everyone for their gracious offerings to the church. And remember, it is necessary because even though the church is not open for worship, we still have to pay our bills. And we thank you, O oh Lord, for the fact that you are there to care for us. And anybody that wishes to make a tithe, they can do that through their local bank account, which you'll find 
uh, on any of your um, uh, leaflets that you have from the church or you can drop them in to uh, uh, us in one way or another. Thank you, Father, and may we all live and enjoy your presence throughout our lives. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, you call and equip us to save you. Watch over those who risk their own safety by caring for oppressed people, by caring for those who are suffering from COVID-19, by caring for those who are suffering from HIV and AIDS, by caring for those who are suffering from cancer, by caring for those who are suffering from different ailments. Strengthen and protect all those who are persecuted for sharing their faith in places where living out their Christian faith in peace is not allowed. Loving God, you empower us to live out our discipleship. Give wisdom, imagination, and strength to preserve, to persevere to those who face apathy as they seek to live out their discipleship. Loving God, you understand what it means to suffer for what is right. Give comfort and courage to those who are unjustly imprisoned, intimidated, tortured because of their faith. Loving God, you taught us to pray for those who abuse and hate us. We pray for those who persecute those who hold their different beliefs from their world, from their own. And may they be tied by faith and their hearts be open to love. That the world may be united in love. We pray for everyone in the world to know that you are God. May you help us, Father, to understand who you are. That you have called us for a mission and a purpose. So that we continue to minister to others with compassion, with love. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.